But I'm going to ask everyone who's on, first of all, welcome, welcome. I would like to ask you to mute your, uh, your, uh, your phones, your mics, so that we are not, I'm going to try to do some of that right now individually, uh, so that we don't run into the uh, challenges of uh, trying to hear more than one, one space. So I'm uh, just doing a little bit in here. I think we have, I don't know how to do that with all of them, but I think I have some of these in there. Um, Barbara McCracken, if you could email, if you can mute yourself as well, that would be great. Um, yes, I just came in on it. <clears throat> perfect, perfect. So, and I'm gonna try to do some of that. It just it gives us a little bit of a, um, so I don't know why I'm getting Barbara McCracken's face on this, but we're going to work on that. Um, and maybe Letitia, you can, we can edit this out, but Letitia, I, I am trying to get the face uh, in there. But um, so uh, allow me though to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, this is our first webinar with the Center for the Study of Consecrated Life. And we're delighted people could come on for this. As you know, we're also taping this, and so it'll be available to uh, the rest of our communities, but it'll be available widely. And um, it's a wonderful opportunity to engage someone who has uh, so much experience and who's willing to share this wisdom. I am going to give a little uh, advertisement, though, ahead of time to all of those who are our 21 community participants. Uh, in the engaging our diversity, uh, interculturality, and consecrated life today. You will be receiving in the next week or two uh, a survey that's the beginning of our ways of putting year three into place and looking at so much of what's happened in the past three years uh, that'll move us toward uh, no another set of questions for you in the winter time that'll then move us towards a final report and gleaning from you some of the best practices. So some of what worked for you, some of what you see as moving but needing more work um, in a way that it could be this whole community of learners, which is the whole point of this. Uh, after three years, we, I think, know that we're only beginning our, um, no matter where we are in this, we're still continuing and in, in always beginning our work on trying to engage our diversity in a way that serves religious life, but even more the church and the world. So, um, so look for that. You'll get it from me. You'll probably get something also from Essential Conversations, which uh, would be the partners we have for uh, helping us look at um, some of the practices and, and learning from all of you. So that's my little advertisement in this. But without further ado, I would like to introduce us uh, all. Some of you know her already. She's a well-known figure. Uh, but to this conversation with Sister Patricia Murray, uh, IBVM, she is uh, an amazing woman who's making inroads in so many areas uh, and bringing us all along with us, with her and engaging us in conversation. Pat Murray is currently the uh, Secretary General of the Institute of the Union of International Superiors General. And so that is the uh, umbrella group over which all the women's congregations really fit under. And she's been working these past years bringing more and more congregations together and giving resourcing as well as listening to um, what the what the needs are all over and so we're happy to have you before this though we're very happy to very proud to say she's a CTU grad uh, both with her master's and her doctorate and it's really in the area of interculturality and she went right from this to starting the solidarity with South Sudan program and uh, an area of real collaboration among congregations of women and men religious. And so we hope to just hear from her on um, all these areas. And so what we'll do uh, for probably the first 30 minutes is I have uh, some questions for Pat and I'll be engaging her. 
and then we'll open it up to all of you, it, um, whatever questions or comments or pieces you would like to offer. Pat knows that um, this is initially for the groups that are part of our Engaging Our Diversity program, um, but that, you know, it's, it, the question is for all of us in this. So, so Pat, in the midst of everything, thank you. Um, here I am in Chicago, and there you are in Rome. Uh, for giving time, just as the Synod on the Amazonia is beginning and there's so much going on. So talk about a need for greater interculturality. All, all of this continues to say that. But a uh, question first uh, for you, Pat, is uh, what brought you into the work of interculturality? So maybe your background, but, but those pieces would be great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you to all of you who are joined here. It's my pleasure to be with you. Um, I was reflecting on what started, uh, what was the trigger for me? And strangely enough, it was, uh, it happened when in my early ministry. I probably didn't call it interculturality in the sense, but I was peace education officer in Northern Ireland. And uh, in Northern Ireland, as you probably know, there has there were 30 years of what are called the Troubles, which was the struggle between, uh, uh, if you like, those who wanted a united Ireland and those who saw themselves aligned with the union with Great Britain. But often it was presented as a re religious conflict between Protestants and Catholics. And uh, one of my big learnings very early on was that this was a cultural struggle. Religion was part of it. But there were, there were many other dimensions um, of culture that were, that were a, caused division, if I, if I might say so, in society. So uh, things like um, uh, your, what flag you, you had uh, allegiance to, even what colors uh, were important in your life. Um, for example, if you were Catholic and nationalist, you were probably likely to favor the color green. If you were Protestant and unionist, the color orange became an important color. Um, so very early on, I began to see that this was, that culture in so many dimensions uh, could divide or unite people. And we had a very simple education program uh, for primary school children in those days. And the, the theme of it was differences are an enrichment to the human community. So I began at that stage to look at difference and diversity and how do you uh, lead people to appreciate and to really nourish, um, nourish and appreciate and learn about difference. Um, and I think I was also very struck at that time that people analyzed life, the world and whatever through their own lens and found it difficult to see things through the lens of another, through the experience of another, through the historical perspective of another. That was my first, I think, shake, this shake up. The second was interesting. It was around a, a general chapter that we had as um, the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as IBVMs. And at that chapter, one of our commitments was to become an international multicultural institute with one mission and one purse. Now, it's very interesting the words we chose and it was in the 1990s. So we talked about being international because our facilitator had said to us rightly, she said, you're not international, you're a federation of nations. Mm. She said, you've never made the journey internationally. And we chose the word multicultural as part of that chapter statement, but it was the wrong word. Because yes, we were multicultural, but our intention was to become intercultural, but we didn't have the language. So I actually did my own research at CTU on this phrase, becoming an international multicultural institute. And very quickly I realized we are a multiplicity of cultures. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how do we, how do we create this new entity where we have 
uh, an appreciation and knowledge and understanding of one another with all our differences. And at that time, we did, we actually did a cultural audit in the congregation. We didn't call it that. But we asked uh, members to participate in our 27 uh, different provinces or regions uh, to, to reflect on what it meant, how you felt as a person with a culture in this institute. And we got, there was some very interesting feedback that gave me a lot of material to reflect on uh, in terms of people uh, feeling that they weren't, that their culture wasn't appreciated, that it was, um, it was not, there was a dominant culture, there was an institutional culture that you, you had to belong to in a sense, that you had to learn and be integrated into, that you lost some of your own culture in the process. Then there was the whole question of uh, the difference in culture between uh, different generations and an appreciation of the, the tension and the struggles that that could bring. Um, you know, I remember one sister writing that she often, she was living in a particular community and she said, I often go to a centre, she was in, 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 in the UK, and she said, I go to a centre to listen to my own language being spoken because I miss my own language so much. So, and there was no place for her to speak her language in community. I remember uh, another Vietnamese sister saying, um, um, I try so hard to get my tongue around the words of, of English, but my tongue doesn't do it very well and they laugh at me. So, you know, there were a multiplicity of little uh, signs. I remember uh, w one of the sisters in the African province saying, you know, we, she said, we think we're the same, but we come from so many different tribes in our province and you have to scoop into the pot, was the way she said it, and taste the difference of, the, of what's in the pot to eat. She said, we, we can nourish each other. Uh, we can challenge each other. So that was part uh, of my journey. Then I think um, uh, I was on, while I wrote my, my thesis for the master's um, degree, I was actually a member of the General Council. So I was traveling to all our different provinces and I, um, I appreciated greatly the learning um, and I had followed the course on uh, cross-cultural learning at CTU. I appreciated the insights that I had received because I began to realize more and more that if I made judgments from my own Irish, um, if you like, European, um, Western perspective, that I could judge things in a very erroneous way. So that I learned that there was a language for culture. Uh, there were fra cultural frameworks that I need to understand. For example, knowing the difference between, you know, how, how you present yourself if you belong to an individualist or a, a communitarian culture. Uh, looking at the power distance, how authority is viewed in culture. So there were many such learnings uh, that helped me hugely um, to actually take up my role um, as, uh, as a, um, a general consultant and somebody in a, in a way that was, that was trying to, as we as a team were trying to foster appreciation of the other and learn from the other so that there was a mutuality. Later on, I, I, I um, was part of the project called Solidarity with South Sudan, where men and women religious from many different cultures came together, lived together and ministered together. And my big learning there was in South Sudan, yes, we brought, we were training teachers, nurses, midwives, um, farmers, pastoral workers. But again and again, the local people said to us, how do you from different tribes mm -hmm. live together? So one of my learnings about religious life today, and I, I really believe it, is we're, we're really called much more about being present uh, than doing, and that, that our international, intercultural presence is a powerful sign and witness. And I see it being repeated today in, 
in the project we have in Sicily, where we have women religious uh, working with migrants, but also working with the local people and being a bridge, uh, being a bridge to carry one another across, to learn from each other. Um, and in today's world, there are so many forces wanting to use difference to divide and to separate and to create enmity that I think one of our challenges today as religious uh, is really to build bridges and bridges. The other day, somebody said to me, you know, uh, I was told I would be a bridge. And I was reminded that when you're a bridge, you're walked on by both sides. Mm. Yeah. So I think there's a challenge in being a bridge that the, it requires, I think Pope Francis said the other day, it requires a humility. It requires a basic attitude of learning, of failing. You know, I've learned a lot, but I've failed a lot. And, you know, you think you've made progress interculturally and then you, you make another mistake. But I think if you're open to feedback and also to learning from the other, I think I've cha I'm changed, the other has changed. Together we, we create something new which is about this commune, communio that we, that we long for and search for in our world today. So that's yeah. some background really from how I arrived at uh, this moment in my life. And I, I mean, I regard it as a wonderful, a wonderful gift. I'm living and working interculturally here at UISG, where we are many cultures. Um, the membership of UISG is almost 2,000 leaders of women's congregations working at the Vatican. I'm all the time, uh, you know, in the sense you're negotiating this. This is the new world. I came in here to Rome in 1998. It, the face of leadership in religious life was a very Anglo face. Now it's a multicultural face. In fact, so... I'm, I'm in the minority now. And, and that's just a wonderful opening to the next piece because you bring so many, you know, experiences in there and, and what a grace that you can learn from all these experiences, mm -hmm. both the successes and places that, that didn't work well. I'm wondering, where have you seen some of the work of interculturality bear fruit in congregations? Um, you know, what new has emerged for you? We have 21 groups that are working on this and sometimes they'll say ah you know it's just uh, we're trying this or we're trying this and and in the midst of it you don't always see it uh but i think you have some of the long view but uh not just across congregations but initially do you have some thoughts on you know where and what you've seen in congregations who are really working toward becoming intercultural communities yeah i, I have seen i think it's congregations who have taken have taken the learning seriously mm. and who begin to build it, build in a sense the the journey of knowledge because this is a new area just like we study spirituality or theology or psychology or human development it, it needs to be a formal area of study within our formation programs so i see congregations really building it into initial and ongoing formation, both in terms of theory and praxis. And I think you need the theory. I, I would say if we don't, if we don't ourselves and with our, um, our newer members, if we don't learn sufficient theory, we don't have the frameworks to undertake the learning in life, in experience. I'm so grateful for my own studies at uh, CTU, but also for the su study and research that I did subsequently and for the ongoing learning I do. It, you don't just stop, I'm learning all the time. Um, I'm reading, I'm listening, I'm, uh, um, and I'm also looking at the whole question from different perspectives. There's the learning from from those who are interculturalists or cultural specialists. But then there's also those who are reflecting from a, a scriptural or a theological point of view, from a missiological point of view, because we're all on mission today. So in, no matter where you are, it's not those for those going on what we would have called foreign mission. We're all in a sense in mission territory. We're all at the new frontiers. We're all dealing with streams of migrants and refugees with the cultural diversity in our own 
um, in our own little um, area of concern or ministry or where we live. So I think it's incumbent on us to learn and to learn from the others. I, I particularly enjoy and asking people, you know, tell me wh what, how you do this. You know, what are your burial rituals? You know, what are your celebrations in your culture? What, what's the what's the language like? And um, I mean, I, I myself, you know, I'm, I'm challenged in the Irish culture, for example, my first language was actually Gaelic for all sorts of reasons. My father was a civil servant. My mother was a teacher. But a lot of places in Ireland, for example, place names were anglicized at the end of the 19th century. So you look at a name and you, you then have to explore, what does that mean? What was the original Gaelic name uh, of that place? And it of, often is a very beautiful name describing the area, whereas the anglicized name means nothing. So, and that in a sense in Ireland, that often puts you like Kildare is a town, but it's Kildara, which is the church of the oak tree. So it automatically roots you into nature. So often, if you like, our cultural um, codes connect the human person with nature itself. And it, it, it allows you to explore life at a deeper level. I'm using that as a very simple example. But I think um, we get, when we enter into the different layers of culture, and it's like peeling off um, an onion. I, for example, in, in my travels, I've been to India maybe 16 times. And what I would say now is how little I know about India. Mm. That every time I visit, I peel back a tiny little layer about some aspect of this extraordinary subcontinent. So you begin to realize, even in terms of one's own cultural appreciation and knowledge of the other, that you, it's a it's a journey, and I getting back to your to your original question. I, I think it's to open up, if you like, where I see congregations open up the journey of exploration of culture. Um, that I I see real progress being made, and also uh, understanding beginning to look at scripture from from cultural perspectives. Like I love the story of Ruth and Naomi, or. You know, so you're, or, you know, I remember uh, reading an article, um, I think by an SVD on, on Abram and Sarah and their ability to enter into a new culture. So you're beginning to see that this is the, hum, the human journey, but it's also a spiritual journey that we can undertake. So my encouragement, and I mean, I here at UISG, like at CTU, We've had, um, with the help of the SVDs and the Holy Spirit Sisters, we've had a wonderful program for uh, 45 congregations, which is ongoing. So I see, um, and we will have one in Africa next year. So I see this journey uh, of, of discovery in terms of, of culture beginning and being extended. And, uh, you know, I think... Um, I think all of us have a responsibility to share what we know with the other um, or to point to this area as an important area for the future of religious life. And congregations are getting the message because they're seeing it in front of them. And what many would say to you in different ways, we thought in the past that it was good enough to put people of different cultures together and they would learn from each other. It does. That's too simplistic. Unless you have the keys to understand, you, you can end up just judging from your own myopic framework. And I have to get, like even today, we, we had a, a prayer service online um, on, as part of the Simmod on, on Amazonia. And somebody just remarked to me beforehand, she said, yesterday, she said, I realized for the first time that the indigenous people see that the, that the earth has rights. Mm. And she said, we, she's, a, she's an Italian woman, and she said, we come from a, from a philosophical framework that's based on 
Rome and Greece, and we see hu rights as human rights. But she said, the indigenous people see the whole question of rights from a totally different perspective. So it's only in, to, in, to, in entering into other cultures like that, that you be, your, your one's own perspective is widened. And I, I loved the Pope yesterday, because obviously he heard some feedback to the indigenous person who carried up the gifts at the mass and maybe people remarking or I don't know in, in a negative way about somebody with feathers and he said well what difference is that to the three-pointed beretta of the of the cardinal <laughs> and they're both in a sense <laughs> cultural expressions of dress but unless you you unless you have that lens you you look at what's different or strange sometimes in a in a kind of a negative way sometimes in a in a kind of what i would call it's it's a curiosity without understanding its its depth and meaning and i think that's the invitation we have is to to go on this journey of discovery no and i so appreciate that pack because you're talking about just ways of being community that can really shift our way of thinking and engaging. I, I spent a month in Brazil and uh, we had a sister, Bet, who um, spoke with us and she spoke in Spanish, but she was in the process of, she had lived for 34 years with, in the Amazon among the indigenous peoples and they asked her to put on paper their language because they didn't want to lose it. And what so struck me was she said, in their language, there is no word vivir, to live. It doesn't exist. The only word that exists is convivir, to live together. To live together. So just that attitude and how that mm. language, you mm. know, years ago, like just shapes my way of thinking. So it was her sharing the culture that she's so connected to and the people and but it, it changes our way of looking at things. So okay, I, I appreciate, you know, your, your point yeah. about that. Yeah. I, and I, think, I think we have to be patient too. It's not a simple journey. And uh, there are levels and layers. Um, and I think we can help each other. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a co-learning that we learn one about the other. And um, so, you know, I, I I see congregations seeing the need to begin this journey and, and uh, therefore I think um, the more resources we can share together, the, the richer this journey will be. Uh, absolutely. I'm wondering, uh, you know, you're talking a lot about the skills needed, the theory needed for this. Um, and, and yet it seems like underneath it all, there's really a need for a conversion. I wonder what your thought is about that skill conversion. Is it a both and? Yeah, for me it's a both and. But I think almost the moment the conversion. I suppose sometimes we begin from different places in a in a journey. Um, sometimes I often think of the pastoral cycle. You know, the experience, the social analysis, the theological reflection, and the action. And I often apply that and say, we enter into that pastoral cycle uh, from different doors. Sometimes it might be through experience that somebody begins to say, I need to understand it, the whole question of culture more. It might be experience in a parish or, or others come in from, they're doing something that's more analytical and comparing difference and sameness or uh, looking at it from a sociological or a, a cultural perspective that that they become interested for others maybe it's more at the level of uh, it's a, it's spirituality and theology but it's a, it's a it's it, it it's another gateway in um, and for others it's through action but i think in all of those four moments what, no matter what gate you enter through there's a moment of conversion where I myself feel called to change because of the experience I've had mm. and to come out of my own area of comfort and to walk in a way that's um, where you're vulnerable um, 
And you can do that at any age and in any place. I think of myself here, I've been in Rome 20 years. But I came here and I worked on a general council for eight years where we functioned in our own space, really, because you're traveling all over the world. And then I went to work. My mission and ministry was in South Sudan. So I went between Rome and South Sudan, where I had a huge amount of learning to do in, in South Sudan in particular, with uh, 65 different uh, tribal groups, with the whole struggle between North and South, with the, with also the, um, the challenge culturally of um, coming together with, uh, with people who really had felt very isolated for, for 50 years or more, felt the world had forgotten about them, felt the church had forgotten about them. So in a sense, you walk a journey with them. And then I come back here into this current role where I had to begin to learn Italian at, in my 60s. Mm. I had some Italian. As, as a friend of mine said, she had enough Italian for coffee, cookies and carn <laughs> carnetti, right? But I had to learn a language at an older age because if you don't have the language, it's not only about communication, but it's, it also gives you um, an entry into a way in which people think and engage with the world. Um, so I think in that stage, there was a conversion required of, of me in terms of um, learning to be very vulnerable again, to be like a child being taught. Uh, both in terms of language and culture and understanding. Um, and I, I think that's, that's part of the way, and it happens again and again if, you, if we want to go on this journey of, of inner transformation. Um, and that's, that's my experience daily here, that I open myself to the surprises mm. that the different intercultural encounters uh, will produce and that I'm honest enough at the end of the day to reflect on how well did I do today or you know was was I you know did did I dominate from a cultural perspective mm. um, or was there space for the other uh, to really um, contribute and to, and to a mutuality that I think we're called to in this communio. And that's, that's powerful what you're bringing up are all those ways, you know, both the skills and, and recognizing and being vulnerable, but also the places where we can find the pitfalls, uh, sure. you know, at times initially unknowingly realizing I, we were taking some cultural dominance in, in a way mm -hmm. of engaging mm -hmm. or even the language we were using. And, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the, you have some other, just even one or two other places where, you know, you, would, as we're continuing to learn, you would say, these are some pitfalls you want to notice and, and try to, you know, not engage as much if, if you could. Like, what would be some places that you've seen um, people fall that, ah, if they only, if I could only help them, this would be just some cautions I would offer. I think it's been honest about our prejudices, mm. uncovering our prejudices and being honest about them. Um, you know, we, we very easily stereotype the other um, and it's catching ourselves when we do that. Um, you know, I, I often apply this to ourselves as Irish people, you know, we would refer to ourselves as the Irish of the welcomes. Mm -hmm. And I would say to people, you know, that we're very hospitable. I said, yes, I, yes, we're very hospitable when you come as a tourist and you visit us, but how hospitable are we when you want to stay? Mm -hmm. So often we have to ch challenge our, our fundamental uh, our, our fundamental values. And I think in religious life, often we have our core congregational values. And I'm not sure that we test those against mm. 
the liminal places or the new frontiers and what is it calling us to? Um, and, and do we allow enough creative space to do the daring thing at an intercultural level? Um, you know, like when we engage in learning about culture, do we, are we prepared to, um, to open the door? Uh, to really let the other in, to change that the other, whether the other is coming to join us as a, a new member of our community, um, but can they can they really change our our face mm. in and change our our inner way of proceeding, or is our, our customs and our way of doing things so entrenched that? You know, which I think the Pope the other day, even in the Synod, he said, you know, we're not about the status quo. We're, we're looking at where the Spirit is inviting us to go through the newness that's coming to us. So I, I think that's that's a profound challenge to us um, to be able to be flexible enough to to change and, and be different and to allow um, to allow religious life itself to evolve and I'm applying it to a religious life. I'm, I'm saying to myself the, often these days that the model of religious life, which was brought from Europe, say, to Africa, um, I'm not sure it works, mm. but uh, in a new context. And can we look at how, how our way of life might be interpreted if with African leadership really looking at how do, how do you live poverty in a communitarian culture? What, what might that look like? Uh, whereas, you know, the, our understanding of poverty is very much based on, um, uh, on an individualist culture where you were very much the lone person entering and you left behind your family. And in a sense, that was very much part of who you were to be. Now, we, you know, people who, men and women entering in Africa, come from communitarian cultures where there's a, a huge expectation of, of you as being a member of this group. So how can, can we explore, for example, uh, what that, how then might we understand uh, poverty, just giving uh, that as an example, the sharing of goods, having things in common. Where where does the boundary of our community end in that kind of context? So there's some of the, the questions when I look at at the you know religious life in a in a cultural context. Uh, you know, there's some of the things I I look at, and uh, you know I'd say. I, I mean, this is just a throwaway comment, but I'd say some of the some of the decisions that we've made, for example, around uh, religious dress, we sometimes don't take the cultural uh, context into account in terms of uh, um, what 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 are the symbols that speak in a different culture at a particular time and and place and allowing people themselves to explore. I was very struck when I went to South Dakota. I remember going into a chapel where um, a particular religious order had been in charge of this parish. And uh, the, the cross in the church was of a native person on the cross. And I would, my first reaction was, oh, this is a wonderful example of of enculturation. And then so in further reflection and discussion, um, somebody said to me, um, the people here hate it, don't like it. Mm. And then in further reflection, we were saying, but who did the enculturation? Who did, who, who interpreted the Christian message in a sense, in a way that meant something to, to the people themselves? that sometimes we can take on um, the role of interpreter and take it away from those 
who's in a sense who who need themselves to undertake undertake that journey. So I there are some the back and forth challenges that I find in religious life in the sense um, allowing the local community to really explore um, religious life in its own context and within its own cultural uh, settings. I don't know if that makes sense, but there, there are some of my, my questions as, as I observe religious life in different parts of the world. No, I, I absolutely agree with you and, and find that really helpful. I think that's a whole part of the need for looking at all of religious life again, mm -hmm. you know, across mm -hmm. our cultures, but for this time. So sure. what are the different ways and, and how do we look for the needs of this time and mm -hmm. in light of what the Spirit's bringing forth, the mm -hmm. way even Pope Francis keeps yeah. talking about that. Yeah. I'm wondering whether you have a thought and then I want to open it up to mm -hmm. uh, our folks here. Um, we've been doing a lot of ad intra with uh, interculturality and you know we're aware of the next one of the next steps is how do we um how do we bring offer be receive the whole call to interculturality also in our ministries you know you've talked about your staff is from all mm -hmm. over the world and that mm -hmm. changed thinking you have different ways of looking even using different languages um but I'm wondering if, like, even for a minute or two, you, you have a thought on that, and then we'll move it to the questions anyone else might have, because mm. you and I could talk about this forever. This is wonderful. Sure. I know. I, I think I just have two quick responses. I think one is formation, but a formation that we do together, rather than we're formed and now we'll form you, <laughs> you know, in the sense that this is a, a journey of mutual exploration between between uh, ourselves and uh, our people in ministry with us, or, you know, that we take the opportunities to create spaces where th these kind of conversations uh, can happen. And I, I think it's, it's through, through building relationship and really genuine interest to want to learn about the other in order to be more effective in ministry, all of us. And often it's, if we're ministering in particular cultures, it's, it's allowing the people of that culture to be the protagonists. And we have something to offer. They have so much more to, uh, both to offer, but to, to critique what we might offer. So I, I think there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a profound mutual respect. And, and I think when, when we realize that we care about the other, Mm -hmm. and care about the earth that on which we dwell that we when we find areas of common concerns we and we own that we come to if you like dealing with an area or, or a problem or whatever from different perspectives if we can share those different perspectives in order to find the fullness of life that the gospel promises us and i think we have it within a within us it's to create each of us um in our ministry context and i think it's to create the space to share that and to appreciate the difference that it is my i often go back to my little primary school or elementary school program in ireland in northern ireland that we taught that differences enrich the human community and i think uh, it's a very simple mantra but i think when i when i work out of that that it's the differences in us, and I'm actually searching to, to, to find, to get people to express that difference, that we're the richer then as a community. That's, that's powerful. Mm. It's a wonderful way to then open us to the next piece of it, which is um, from the, we have members from different participating communities, and I'm wondering if uh, any of you have a comment or a question for Pat. If you start talking, I'll unmute you, or you may be able to unmute yourself. So we'll see how we do this. Does anybody have a thought? And maybe if you raise your hand or something, I'll, I'll know to get to you if I can. You could start talking. Did any of that make sense to you? <laughs> or, did, or what did it awaken in you? Yeah, Nancy. Okay, wait, Nancy, I'm going to unmute you. All right, Nancy. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, um, oh, this is awesome. Just wonderful. 
Um, and, and just to let you know, one of the things that really just, oh my gosh, struck a bell in my head was when you talked about curiosity versus understanding. And, and the reason is, is because we're getting ready for our chapter in 2020. And I've just written a proposal on um, intercultural living. We're an international community and um, how could we foster more intercultural living? And um, so I've made this proposal and part of the proposal is to suggest that we could even do shorter term um, opportunities for sisters to uh, share life in different communities throughout the world. But then, but when you said that thing about curiosity versus understanding, I, I, it just, it really, it, it just, all of a sudden I had this thought of, oh my gosh, so this uh, lovely young woman from wherever comes and lives in my community and how much of that time will be spent if it's a short period of time in just being curious about her culture and curious about the culture that I live in, sure. as opposed to really doing something deeper. And then I, then you were speaking about skills that it's really clear to me that if any community says that they would be willing to um, do this intercommunity um, uh, intercultural experience, then that's, that community has to be prepared ahead of time. They need formation to be ready to engage in what I'm gonna call an experiment. And part of what I'm suggesting is that this be actually sort of like a, um, what is it that students do? They, the exchange program. Yeah. Because some of our smaller uh, provinces are very unwilling to let anybody leave because they, they literally need the sister power of each and every member so we would feel the need to make sure that at least there'd be another body be there if they gave one up. Yeah. So that's kind of like what my proposal is. Yeah. But anyway, I now know that when I go to my own um, provincial chapter meeting, one of the things I'm going to now talk about is the formation within any community that would uh, deign to um, participate in this. So um, I just thank you greatly because that like raised a whole new thing for me. So. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Nancy. Yeah, you know, I think you're, and I think that's a very interesting uh, initiative that you're proposing. Um, I like it. In my own congregation, we've held a series of, um, of meetings, and it's been very interesting because bringing people of different cultures from different provinces together just to share about religious life. And, uh, but also doing it giving some background to, to culture and intercultural understanding and intercultural communication. But the initial reaction from some people was, uh, what's the purpose of this meeting? Uh, so often, often we, we all were so task driven that we don't see that actually the purpose can be a wonderful purpose is to get to know one another at a deeper level and to get to understand uh, the other from from many different perspectives including a cultural perspective but it's to give people i think the tools to understand um, um I, I when i studied at ctu i developed a, a kind of i think it was an eight lens eight lenses for understanding culture and um it, it was something that I felt needed to be part of any um, part of the, the the tools or the skills for any formation program. If you wanted to get a handle on on trying to understand the the cultural perspective of the other, um, but there are lots of tools now, and uh, you know, s simple and otherwise. But I do, you've put your finger on it. Formation, they do need formation. It's not, it's not enough just to send people. Um, because you can miss the experience. Go ahead. Okay, can so I, yeah. one thing I just left out, very brief, is the, another part of my proposal is that all formation and vocation be done internationally, that all formators from everywhere and all vocation directors from everywhere be able to um, share with each other our experiences so we can glean best practices from other places. Precious, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. 
other thoughts, other things that are resonating for people? Barbara, what was your reaction? I'm putting you on the spot, but uh, I'd just like to hear from you. <laughs> are you talking to me? Yeah. Are you talking to me? Oh, okay. <laughs> who, I, I see the name Barbara Kramer, so I'm saying yes. whoever's in that little oh. group, maybe, <laughs> yeah. The three of us here, but... <laughs> um, what we... Um, I, I mean, I really appreciate what you shared, Pat. I think it is right on in terms of uh, who we need to be and what we need to do. Um, we are international, but our vocations are coming from India, North and yeah. South India. And uh, from the Northeast, from the sister states in the Northeast, which are from different cultural groups. Mm -hmm. And we have the challenge of really building intercultural communities from the first moment that these young women come to us and come together. Um, and what we have taken as a direction, as a congregation, is to weave our hearts for intercultural life and mission. And we have uh, had the uh, facilitation from Maria Elena, what's her last name? Ramirez? Martinez. Martinez. And what she said to us was that we need to be conscious and intentional mm -hmm. about our goal, our, our efforts toward intercultural life and mission. So that uh, when we have a Skype call with a provincial team or a regional, uh, that we should focus on what are the efforts that they are making mm -hmm. in their province to foster intercultural life and mission mm -hmm. or to be, do intercultural formation. Mm -hmm. And we are also trying to do this with a congregational formation plan that we are developing. And actually, we're having a meeting in November in India uh, for the third meeting of that uh, Congregational Formation Committee. Mm -hmm. And we developed um, goals for the formator and outcomes for the for me yeah. um, in, the, in the area of interculturality as well as in other areas. Yes. And we're going to really focus on those goals and outcomes to see how they uh, fit within a framework of moving from ethnocentrism to ethno-relativism at the different stages, postulancy, novitiate, temporary, professed, um, to see if we are really building something, at least in terms of our goals and outcomes. And from there, we need to move to a formation plan and a program. And we're really uh, talking about how we can do, what stage of formation we would do uh, across cultures, you know, how we would bring this together. So, I mean, it's, we're working on the things that you are talking about. Yes. Yeah. But it's a lot of work. It's, and it's, it's I mean, a lot of work. we have to yeah. be, if the members of the committee, where are the members of the committee yeah. are with all of this, you know? Yeah. And in a sense, the, you know, the, you do need to work at it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and India is a, is a challenge because there, there's such a multiplicity of cultures within, within the Indian subcontinent. So, mm -hmm. and I think part of the journey is you begin to understand, you help the participants to understand one's own culture because it's a bit like... Um, it's a bit like education. I remember my mother saying about ev education, everybody thinks they know, they understand education because they've been educated. Okay. It's a bit like that about culture. We all think we know culture because we live in a culture, but often, I go back to Ireland now, the culture, the cultural shifts are enormous. Um, so you, you also learn that um, I'm not Italian, I'm not, I'm, I'm not Irish either, quite. 
<laughs> I am both and, and either or. <laughs> yes. So you, you live in, in, in many of the experiences that we as religious go, undertake. You, you, in a sense, you, you, you've, you've something of both and, and yet, and needing to understand one's own and the shifts in one's own culture. To, but you're not living it in the same way, perhaps, and also in the in the new culture in which you're living or experiencing, um, to understand that, and then sometimes there's the congregational culture. So helping mm -hmm. helping uh, young younger members and newer members to understand um, to have a framework to understand um, the journey from from egocentric to a relative is, I think, very important. And uh, um, mm -hmm. I, I just say it, it's complex, it's not simple. However, uh, you know, when you have a formation plan and you have steps in progress, um, that's, that's, that's a huge bonus for the people, for, for, the, for your for, formators and your formees. So I applaud you for mm -hmm. that. Because I think it has to happen at the level of formation. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. That it's such a key, it's a key element. And in a way, the rest of us are catching up on something that wasn't part of our own formation. Um, if I could uh, ask Maria a question, um, one of the uh, one of the things that we're also concerned about is preparing formators for intercultural formation. And I know as you there is a program to prepare formates. And do you know if this intercultural dimension is incorporated into that program, Maria? Yes, um, thank you for asking that question. Uh, the, from the beginning with our program uh, on engaging our diversity, the people who were participating in the interculturality program uh, or in the IRF program, Institute of Religious Formation, have participated in it. So they couldn't do the two years, but each group, because they were there for a whole year, have been part of that um, and took that, I can't remember if they took the ICS or not, but they've also had um, significant amounts. I, I would say Tony Gittins and some of the other speakers really engaging them in a workshop format rather than just a lecture or a, a presentation. So they've had a series of days with that. And I know um, the newer uh, coordinator of the IRF has been very keen on just being attentive to that and saying, you know, what do we have in, and even who are our speakers and how do we continue to you know, build those spaces in there. So, so there is an intentionality on it in terms of presentations and workshops. Uh, they have been doing that for, for a while, but you know, it's, as you were saying, as we're all saying and Pat as well, it's really being attentive to what, what and how are we doing this because the group itself is international. So they, you know, they're in some of the courses I teach. And so, from the beginning, they're aware of that. And even things like, what does mass look like? You know, what is liturgy like if coming, I mean, you know, as a from Africa with the lens of this is how we do it. And you're also trying to open up spaces and say, but how are other ways of doing this? And, and where do you bring in prayer uh, your cultural dimensions in there. But, but to really, uh, you know, I think the gift of a nine month program where they literally live together, as you go through that whole period of the honeymoon, this is wonderful to, but wait, how are we doing this? And, and what are we choosing? And can we have those more difficult conversations? Uh, and I think, you know, just that point Pat was making about you know, the vow of poverty, uh, I get a lot of conversation about celibacy, you know, how do we understand it from different lenses when progeny is key coming out of an African context? And, and how do we bring those different lenses uh, into this? So that I think is part of the whole. And I think, you know, we do need to do more work on that. 
um, I, I think there's an awareness and an intentionality of it and just going, how do we deepen this? And, uh, you know, and we're always, you know, I'm very open as you're, it would be great to even share our different or across congregations, our different ways of trying to do formation plans or engaging the conversations. Because, you know, with this, you're also getting gender. Because they're, you know, very different cultures. Um, and so yeah. uh, how do we yeah. do this? You know, I was just uh, at a meeting yesterday with the foundation and the whole conversation was on the vows. And, you know, are men talking about the vows to women? Are women talking about the vows to women? How, you know, where is it? Um, you know, what are our healthy ways uh, looking at this? So I, you, you're naming these areas. So yes, we're, we're doing pieces of it, but goodness knows there's always, you know, it, it's a learning curve. Mm -hmm. at, at UISG, we've begun uh, re, re uh, initiated our Form, training or formators program. It's a five month training program. It's not a residential program, but um, we have uh, 40 participants from, particularly from Asia, Africa, a couple from Latin America, and a couple from Europe. But again, it's the experience. And if you like, the whole question of culture and interculturality is treated for again seriously because obviously that's the that's the future both in terms of input but also in terms of reflection on their experience together what are they learning and giving them in a sense some of the the tools to understand their learnings i think is important mm -hmm. well i'm aware we're at our hour um, and there, there just could be endless conversations. But I think what we've done is begun another conversation. And I, you know, certainly, Pat, want to thank you so much for uh, just taking the time out and your very busy schedule. But, but just to, you know, offer these, you know, great points of wisdom that, I, you know, I hope all of us in the interculturality programs will continue to do because I think you continue to model for us um, when you're living it and sharing it, then others can learn and we can learn from one another. And that's the, that's the whole point of it. That's, you know, and that's something that religious life can witness to uh, in going at this. So um, I want to just offer a couple points here of, uh, you know, detail. So again, um, those of you who are part of the Engaging Our Diversity program, you will be getting in the next week or two um, a survey of questions. And then in the winter, you'll be also getting another set that we'll be asking you for a little more detail about what you've been creating, what you've been doing, because our point is to really create um, from the final report, uh, some of the you know, wisdom that's come forth from what has worked, what has not worked, uh, what you would do differently. So it's, it's meant to be you know, brought far more widely. And uh, we will of course, be attentive to how that's communicated and all of this, but all of that will lead into our May 8th to 10th gathering, you know, which won't be you coming in with anything, but you'll be bringing in that experience, but we'll be offering pieces, engaging the learnings uh, in, in doing some uh, further pieces. And everyone will have a copy of the book, uh, of, um, that compilation of the presentations that have been part of our last two years. So we're very excited. Orbis is very excited with it too. Um, so just want to say that. And this will be, give us about a week. Uh, Rick Monty in our IT department is, is going to do some, a bit of editing for us on this. And then it'll be posted on our Center for the Study of Consecrated Life website. Uh, and just invite you to use it. Please share it. Let us know what you think. Um, Pat will, you know, if you want to use a link for that as well with the, the work you're doing, um, you know, it's, it's meant, it's communal. So, um, Pat, thank you so much. I always love conversation with you. I love sitting with you, engaging, and it's wonderful to do that with this wider group and know that um, we're, 
we're doing our part, our, our little bit, which is moving towards that world that God longs to help us see and uh, create with God. Thank you very much for inviting me. It, it was my great pleasure. Um, and uh, I owe a lot to see to you. So, uh, which began, helped me begin my learning journey. So, which is ongoing. So, the great thing is we're doing this together across the world. And I think that's, it's, that's surely showing that we're responding to the needs of today and into the future. So God bless everybody for the, the remainder of your program. Lovely to see you, Roger. Amen, amen. We'll so thank you. <laughs> thank you okay. very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much indeed. God bless. Bye-bye.